Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, before we introduce uh, tonight's illustrious speakers, I wanted to introduce myself and my cohort. Come up here. Can you share? <laughs> uh, I am Dr. John Mulcahy. I'm the director of Carnegie's Observatories uh, Department, which is located in Pasadena, California. Um, this is my colleague, Yi Shen. Say hi. <laughs> uh, from the Department of Embryology. Uh, we are currently serving as interim co-presidents for the Carnegie uh, Institution uh, while we search for a new president. As you may know, uh, Matthew Scott, our previous president, retired at the end of uh, December. So we're really thrilled to be here. We've both been at Carnegie many, many years and are happy to be part of this event. Uh, we're big fans of the cap capital science uh, lectures and we look forward to spending the next few with you. Uh, just as a reminder, the next one is March 26th, I think, so put that on your calendar. What's that? March 29th, it helps to read the script. This is why you're supposed to, I like to go off script, as you'll soon discover over the next few months. Um, I also want to take the chance to thank so many of you uh, who donated $10 tonight um, when you came in to really help support this program. It really means a lot to us. With that, I'm going to let Yishan introduce our uh, speakers for tonight. All right. I'm going to use a script. <laughs> um, thank you, John, for the general introduction. Understanding the nature surrounding us is a shared human desire. Here I want to quote the French physiologist Claude Bernard. The science of life is a superb and dazzling life form, which may be reached only by passing through a long and ghastly kitchen. These words written in 1865 bring to mind the sacrifice of scientists willing to forego comfort and caution to seek the nature's truth. We think of early naturalists and explorers who navigate the unknown territories, physicians infecting themselves with malaria and yellow fever, uh, physicists expo knowingly exposing themselves with radiation. Even today, we have scientists who are willing to forego comfort and embracing discomfort for their science, for the sake of their science. Our guests tonight are decidedly decidedly among these scientists. For over 40 years, doctors Peter and Rosemary Grant um, have really studied the process of evolution on a tiny barren island in the Galapagos. This island is home to several Darwin's finches that, that are really iconic. It experienced torrential rains, massive droughts, and really equatorial heat. The Grant's biographer, Jonathan Weiner, had written, comparing this island in his book, The Beak of the Finch, to the solar face of Mercury. <laughs> the Grants were among the very first people. This, this discomfort has come with amazing rewards because Grants become the very first people who actually watched the, uh, in real life, the selection process of natural selection, even speciation, that many in action that surprised many of us that evolution can actually occur in such a quick time, time scale. Collaborating closely for the entire 50 years plus of their marriage, the grants were Emeriti professors of evolutionary biology at Princeton University. They were both born in Britain and earned their PhDs in other countries, Rosemary at Uppsala University and Peter at the University of Pr British Columbia, where they met. They then taught and did research at McGill University, followed by the University of Michigan before making Princeton their home base since 1985. Fellows of the Royal Society and members of the Na National Academy of Sciences, they are among the most celebrated modern biologists. Their many awards include the Darwin Wallace Medal, the 2005 Balzan Award for population, for population biology, the 2009 Kyoto Prize, and most recently, the 2017 Royal Medal. This last award is a fitting tribute to their connection to Charles Darwin, who provided the inspiration for their scientific journey. 
Darwin received the Royal Medal in 1853. It is difficult not to keep on going talking about this amazing scientist, the icons in the field of evolutionary biology. But in the interest of time, I will yield the floor and I want to invite everybody to give um, Rosemary and Peter Grant the warm welcome. That's the best part of the evening. <laughs> Thank you for a lovely, warm introduction uh, uh, to the uh, lecture that we will give for the title that is on the screen. I think many of us are uh, just dazzled by the enormous variety of extraordinary organisms in nature. Whether we are hiking in the mountains of either this continent or in Europe, whether we are walking in the tropical rainforests, whether we're snorkeling past coral reefs, or whether we're simply admiring a variety of organisms as museum specimens. How does this variety evolve? Where does it come from? How, does it, how is it produced by processes of nature? Now, Rosemary and I are evolutionary biologists and we try to answer those questions with studies of ecology, behavior, and genetics. And like many people who do the same thing, and I emphasize there are many evolutionary biologists asking those same questions, like many of us, we find ourselves following in the footsteps of those two Victorian naturalist giants, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin. They gave us a theory of evolution by natural selection to work with, a theory that can be applied to the origin of species. And not only that, but they gave us guidance on where to explore the implications of the theory and make new discoveries. This is what they wrote. Wallace wrote, before he went out to the tropics to do, uh, for a decade of research, I should like to take some one family to study thoroughly, he wrote, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. By that means, I'm strongly of the opinion that some definite results might be arrived at. Rather general and open-ended, Darwin, sometime later, a little bit more pedantic, very precise, and absolutely to the point, wrote the following. Those forms which possess in some considerable degree the character of species, but which are so closely similar to some other forms or are so closely linked to them by intermediate gradations, the naturalists do not like to rank them as distinct species. They are in several respects the most important to us. Well, there are many groups of organisms that fit the bill and Anolis lizards in the Caribbean are one such group. 150 species in total in that archipelago. And I will just illustrate the enormous variety of some groups with one other uh, group of organisms. And that's the cichlid fish of the Great Lakes of Africa. And literally, there are hundreds of different species to be found in a single lake. Our chosen group is a more modest one, but nonetheless interesting and stimulating. It's Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands. They live in a very uh, challenging and dynamic environment over the long haul. They've been in existence for about a million years. We know that from mitochondrial DNA dating. And over that one million years, their environment, the Galapagos Island, has undergone quite some change. They are volcanic in origin, and they owe, most of them owe their origin to a hot spot just to the south of the western island of Fernandina. They lie on a plate that is punctured by volcanic activity, and that plate is moving south-southeastwards towards the uh, continent of South America at the rate of 60 kilometers per million years. They or 60 what are they, millimeters per year, if you like, if you're able to measure it. <laughs> so islands have been formed, and as the plate has moved away from that hotspot, they have subsided. Now, 
In addition, the sea level has changed as a result of glacial, interglacial cycles um, in the polar regions. So the sea level has gone up and down, which makes the islands look as if they've gone bigger and uh, smaller, uh, taller and uh, shorter. Um, the ice has been locked up, I mean water, I should say, has been locked up in the polar regions for periods, 10 times in the last million years, and then released as water. And so if we had been around, able to see this process, we would see the following. The, as, the, uh, as the water gets uh, more and more locked up as polar ice, the islands become bigger and even coalesce into larger land masses. And then the ice melts and we see everything in reverse to the current condition. That is what the islands look like. Whoops, I missed out one. That's what the islands look like now. In, in, I, I'm looking at the wrong screen here, so maybe I should do this one more time very quickly. This is what happens when uh, water is locked up as ice, and when it melts, then the global sea level rises to this position here. So, how do they, in this changing environment, how are species formed? Well, the answer was first sketched out by uh, Darwin with his theory that I'm going to uh, translate into simple language and apply to the Galapagos Islands, starting with the principle of what speciation is, the formation of two species from one. It's basically a process of splitting of a lineage into two. Once again, I'm looking at the <laughs> wrong screen here. Okay, got it. So it is the splitting of a lineage into two uh, at this point, with the lines diverging to the point at which they are no longer capable of interbreeding, at which point everybody would agree that they have reached the stage of separate species. Darwin was very impressed by the degree to which this process would be fostered by spatial separation of the lineages. And here are his ideas, as I say in uh, modern language, applied to the Galapagos. The theory of his theory of separate evolution and speciation has three ingredients. One is dispersal. So dispersal from South America to the Galapagos in the first place, and then dispersal around from one island to another. Everything is hypothetical here. The second ingredient is change in different island environments, in allopatry as we call it. And why? Because the islands are different in their food supply and therefore challenges for finches to exploit. And also there are random processes taking place as well. And then the third ingredient is the coming together of previously separated populations and further divergence by natural selection that minimizes two things. One is competition for resources, principally food, and the other is hybridization or interbreeding if the product of interbreeding, the offspring, are relatively unfit, infertile or inviable. Now, about 40 years ago, we began a study of Darwin's finches on across the whole of the archipelago, trying to establish the relationship between variation in the finches and variation in their environment. In other words, we were seeking an explanation for the pattern of evolution that occurred over the past. To understand evolution as a process, we chose to work on this small island of Daphne Major in the center of the archipelago, which ha is home to four species. And before I uh, continue with the research, I want to interrupt the narrative by giving you a little introduction to what it's like to be on the islands. A video was made by uh, Bill Curtis in 1995, uh, and if I can find the right place here, I will start it off. Oh, I'm sorry. Once again, I'm having difficulty with the... The evolutionary biologist. Easy. This is the most wonderful place on Earth. Yeah. Too bad. I wish I could just admit that. Yeah. There's a thing coming right up. 
Peter and Rosemary Grant made their first trip here 22 years ago to this island called Daphne Major to begin a field study on a group of birds called Darwin's finches. To land on Daphne, you truly have to want to get on this island. There's one rock to jump onto, surrounded by 300 feet of shark-infested water. Before they climb up, straight up, they'll rinse everything, tents, nets, food, in the ocean. John, give me some in a bucket. I'll do it here. Bringing in any new plants or predators could be disastrous to the finches. <laughs> Bringing in anything that might alter the environment, parasites, insects, could be disastrous to their study. Yep. Well, I'm washed, are you? <laughs> The finches on Daphne, like the rest of the animals in the Galapagos, have no fear of humans. They simply don't know they should. They have few enemies, except for an occasional owl, and even fewer competitors for food. There Pause. Measure of evolution. The grants are about to show me it doesn't. You go for the net, you don't know what is there. We head for the nets. Is this where you catch all the birds? We catch them all over the island. Here's one good place because the birds roost here. And you put it up when it was cool. Yes, and we're going to get these birds out before the sun rises up and strikes the net because we want to measure the birds and release them before it gets too hot. Can you tell immediately what species they are? Yes, this is a scandens. I'll have to check the book to see if it's a back cross, but it looks like a scandens uh, 5069. He owns the territory over there. And then here we have fortis, a small fortis, small, small beak, beak right. fortis, that's right. You have a magnorostris down there. Big beak. Yes, undoubtedly big beak. And then this one is a... Pause. And they began to bend them in order to understand who survives best, under what conditions, when we put bands on it. And we code the color bands in such a way that we never need to capture the bird again. Disappeared. Something three. At one point in their study, they banded every finch on the island. The next step is to measure the birds, Peter's job. Like that, pinch it there so that it can't come back. I mean, fly backwards and upwards and out. I then weigh it. 18.6 grams. And again, the reason for this? Uh, measuring size, different aspects of the size of the birds in order to understand who survives best, under what conditions. We need to measure so many birds. <laughs> and now I'll measure the length of one element of the leg. And then the next one I take is the length of the beak. Now this seems to be the most critical measurement you're going to make. The beak dimensions are the critical feature, at least one critical feature determining success or failure of these birds. So I measure the depth or the height of the beak in the plane of the nostril. And that is 8.6. And then I measure the width of the beak at the base of the lower mandible there. And that one is also 
While Peter does the measurements, Rosemary takes blood samples. And now release it. For the first 10 years they made their annual pilgrimage to Daphne, the Grants made it a family outing, bringing their two daughters, Nicola and Talia. For eight weeks a year, it was the girls' summer home. We did know it was dangerous. We knew that they could break a leg or, or do something like this, but we told them that this was a possibility and that they had to be careful, and they were. How do you like the shark-infested waters? <laughs> These are the four species on the island. There, it, on the island, there is a uh, small, a medium and a large finch and a cactus finch with a relatively long beak. Now I'm going to show a picture of all of the populations of all four species on a beak width, beak length plot. Here's Fortis and Scandins, the two important species on the island. Fortis down here for Daphne and this is the Scandins population uh, on Daphne also with population sizes of about 100 and uh, 50 breeding pairs, respectively. They differ in ecology. Fortis is a granivore, a seed eater. Now, we banded a very large number, hundreds of birds, measured them, released them, watched what they fed on, and from all of that information, we know that those birds observed feeding only on small seeds, had small beaks, and those feeding on small, medium, and large seeds had very large beaks on average. So the species is a generalist, but with some degree of individual specialization. Scandins, on the other hand, is a specialist. It's a cactus specialist. It, with its long beak, probes cactus flowers to get at nectar and pollen. And with that long beak, it drills holes in the side of fruits like this, extracts the seeds and cracks them and eats the kernels. Now, are these uh, finches uh, actually evolving? And if so, how and why are they doing so? And what does it tell us about speciation? I'll attempt to answer these questions, starting with the first one with a resounding, yes, they are indeed evolving. Over a 40-year period, Fortis, the medium ground finch, has undergone changes in beak depth with three uh, periods of natural selection standing out against a general background. One in 1977, um, a, a lesser one in the 80s, and then a sharp decline in the 2004. The circumstances of these three are different and I will describe each one separately. But there is a common denominator, and that is each one was associated with a drought. A scarcity of food, starvation, and a heavy degree of mortality. So first of all, in 1977, there was almost uh, no rain fell, and the average beak depth of Fortis underwent a steady increase until the end of the year. 80% of the forties died. And the reason is this. They started off with a, an abundance of small, soft, easy-to-handle seeds, and forties were able to consume those. When the, that supply of food had become depleted, finches had to turn increasingly to the large and hard seeds that remained in... Uh, a relative abundance, although absolutely not very common, including this one shown by an icon up here, a tribulus, a woody fruit. Well, only birds with large, deep beaks can crack something like that to get at the seeds on the inside. So the large uh, birds with deep beaks survived, and the others, the smaller birds, started dropping out of the population uh, at a high rate. Natural selection had occurred. Now, evolution is not natural selection. It is the change in genetic composition of a population from one generation to the next. And that's exactly what happened. And the reason is the offspring of the survivors produced in 1978 when they started to breed, the offspring inherited those genetic factors for producing large beaks from their parents. And um, 
they uh, consequently had large beaks like their parents. Thus, uh, what had happened was natural uh, evolution had occurred by natural selection on a heritably varying trait, beak depth. For mechanical or functional reasons that we could understand when the environment changed. The environment changed again later in a very dramatic way. It was the El Nino of 1983, which according to coral core data was the most intense El Nino event in the Eastern Pacific over the last 400 years. So our little desert island received 1.3 meters of rain over a period of eight months, and it transformed the vegetation of the island from something looking very dry like that to a much wetter and greener environment. Tribulus, the plant that produced those large, hard, woody fruits that made the difference between survival and death in 1978, was smothered by the growth of grasses and vines. The vines that grew up over the bushes, they grew up over the trees, they grew up over each other. And then eventually the island started to dry out. And two years later, there was a complete drought. Now, the food composition had changed from one dominated by large and hard seeds to one dominated by small soft seeds. And now the selective pendulum swung the other way towards favoring the small birds with small beaks, and particularly small pointed beaks, capable of picking up large numbers of very small seeds and processing them rapidly to meet the bird's metabolic daily needs. The third episode involved yet another factor. This was Magnirostris, the large ground finch. Two females and three males established a breeding population in that extraordinary El Nino year of 1983. Well, gradually their numbers built up, and so by 2004, when the next severe drought occurred, there was more than 150 individuals on the island. Now, you don't need much imagination to realize that these birds have powerful jaw muscles and are capable of cracking very efficiently a tribulus fruit. So what they uh, outcompeted the large members of the Fortis population as the seed supply Di uh, declined, and birds, uh, the large ones, uh, depleted the supply of the tribulus fruits. The small members of Fortis were also dying, but they were dying at a slower rate. These were dying at a high rate, thanks to the large ground finch. And so the average beak size of the population took a nosedive. And that's what I indicated at the beginning with that very sharp decline in average beak depth as a result of competition from Magnarostris. This is an example of character displacement, the phenomenon I mentioned earlier of divergence of two species that come together and interact competitively in a, a single environment. Well, that tells us about uh, the external factors um, responsible for evolutionary change to take place in a changing environment. What about the internal factors, the genetic factors? Well, in combination, collaboration with Leif Anderson at the University of Uppsala, we have done a genomic uh, analysis of the finches and discovered two genes that are related to uh, beak morphology. One, HMGA2, affects beak size. And the other one, ALX1, affects beak shape. HMGA2 is a gene widespread in vertebrates. It occurs in dogs, it occurs in rabbits and mice, and it, occur it occurs in us. And it played a significant role in the character displacement episode that I have just described. ALX1 comes in two variants, one affecting the pointedness of a beak and another one affecting the bluntness of the beak, or polar opposites in beak shape. And that one is also very interesting and also occurs in us as well as other vertebrates. It affects the development, it regulates the development of uh, facial bones, bones in our faces when we are in embryos uh, developing a full head. And mutations in this gene 
caused, among other disruptions to development, cleft palate. So I'm going to conclude, before handing over to Rosemary, with these three points about evolution by natural selection. It occurs when the environment changes and results in pre predictable evolutionary change. Other species determine the direction of evolution, up or down, in the case of our own study. And both of these core are core ingredients of speciation. And I want to emphasize that we have studied the beginning of the speciation process and not the process leading to the whole, uh, to the completion of the formation of two species. And I'll just uh, end with one diagram more to illustrate that very point. This shows beak length plotted against beak uh, depth for the Fortis population, and every point refers to the annual average of these two dimensions. E stands for early. So the population started down here. In 1977, there was the selection event that drove the population up into this region. The mid-80s, it went across here. The population randomly wandered about in this region here until 2004, when under selection, there was a very strong shift down here. Now, the, the speciation trajectory is one, you might say, that starts here and finishes down here. But it goes on way off the screen to somewhere round about here. So we've studied the beginning of this process. The completion will be reached when the population is so different from other species that they will be very unlikely to interbreed. And the pathway towards that state is not a straight line as is the simplest expectation, but one that is somewhat erratic according to the somewhat erratic changes in the environment. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Rosemary. This is the easiest point to get onto the island. <laughs> so I will just go back to, um, to this diagram for a, s a moment and just when Peter said how much the um, fortis had changed, but there's this extraordinary shift in allometry which occurred in 1986. So what was this due to and that actually caused another way of looking it, at it, the fortis population that started off with um, blunt bills, bills to suddenly shift to a much more pointed beak which remained that way for the next 30 years. Well, the answer to that is it was actually at this point in 1986 here that we got the first um, hybrid back cross between Fortis and Scandens. So what caused this rare hybridization between Fortis and Scandens, and why did some hybrids between Fortis and Scandens survive to back cross in 1986 and not before then? So my part of the talk is going to... Um, be looking at the causes and evolutionary consequences of rare gene flow between Fortis and Scandens. And then I'm going to tell you one of the most exciting parts of our study, um, which is the formation of a new lineage, which we have followed from its inception um, through six generations. But first of all, to understand what are the causes and evolutionary consequences of rare gene flow, we have to ask, what are the pre-mating barriers to reproduction between the species? And why did this barrier occasionally leak? Well, in all Darwin's ground finches, of which Scandens and Fortis are part, um, they all have similar plumage. Males are black, females are brown. They all build similar nests, these dome nests. And as far as we can tell, they all have similar courtship display. But they do differ in two respects. They differ in song and they differ in morphology, particularly body size and beak size and shape. So we, we can recognize the birds in this way, but can the birds? So one of the first things we did when we went onto the island was to ask, can individual birds discriminate between their own and another species purely on the basis of morphology in the absence of song? And then can they do this by song in the absence of morphology? So to understand if they could discriminate between their own and another species by appearance, 
we took stuffed museum specimens, a female fortress and a female scandent, put it on either side of a, 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 a branch, took them into a territory and asked, could the living territory owner discriminate between its, a female of its own species and female of another? And the answer was a resounding yes. They clearly quartered a female of their own species, ignored the other one, even though it was just a stuffed museum specimen. And then we asked, um, can they do the same thing with song in the absence of any morphological cue? To do this, we recorded song, played back Fortis song. Fortis came into the loudspeaker. Scandens completely ignored it. We played back Scandens song. Scandens came in. Fortis ignored it. And we did the standard thing. We did it many times, and we had a control as well. So clearly, just as we can discriminate on the basis of morphology and song, so can the birds. Now, song is very important. So um, or I should just say the song is very different. Um, Fortis song has a modulated song. To us, it sounds like um, as though it's a Swiss bird. It sings mostly moosely. And the Scandans have a song which has repeated notes. There is individual variation in birds between songs, but always on a species-specific specific song theme. We know from work that was done by Bowman um, in the 1950s on captive breeding birds that song is learnt from the father in association with his appearance during a very short receptive period of time between day 10 and day 40. Now, this period coincides with the last few days in the nest, and when the bird is out of the nest being fed by its parents, and all this time the father is singing, females don't sing. So it's not, it, so once um, the song is learnt, the song is retained for life. We have done repeated recordings of the same bird for songs for, um, for life. Life can be as long as 17 years, and we have never known a song change. And as adults, they pair according to their species song. So this constitutes a pre-mating barrier to interbreeding. Based on song, it is learnt and culturally transmitted from father to son and appearance, particularly beak and body size, which um, is genetically um, transmitted, as Peter has told you. So we can ask how robust is this pre-mating barrier, because after all, it is vulnerable to disruption if a young bird hears and learns a song of another species during this short sensitive period. And this does happen. It happens rarely. It happens conti continuously in every breeding um, season. There will be about 1% of the birds that do this. And this actually happened with the colonization of Magna Rostris. Now, Magna Rostris came onto the island. It's a bird that is twice as big as Fortis. It has a loud song, and it is extremely aggressive. The song is sung in the same frequency band as Fortis and Scandin's song. And over the years, we've had eight Fortis and two Scandins that have learnt and sung a Magna Rostris song. So this is a typical Magna Rostris song at the bottom. Here is one of the Fortis that sang a Magna Rostra song, a normal Ma Fortis song is like this, normal Scandin song like this, but here is one of the Scandins that sang a Magna Rostra song. Now, none bred with a Magna Rostra, so why was this? Well, when the birds, these little birds, opened their mouths and sang a Magna Rostra song, Magna Rostra whipped in as if from nowhere and just beat them up. <laughs> so they never got anywhere. <laughs> But so when the size difference is very large, the, this barrier is, seems to be robust. Even learning another species song didn't lead to hybridization. But this is very different when the size difference between species is small, with a approximately 17 gram fortis and a 22 gram scandens, the size difference isn't very big. And learning another species song can lead to hybridization. And as I say, this is rare, but it happens. So we were able to take these hybrids and ask, is there any evidence of genetic incompatibility? How fit are their hybrids? Are they viable? Are they fertile? Now, for the first 10 years of our study, we'd followed these few hybrids 
and we thought, aha, we might be seeing some genetic incompatibility because none of our hybrids survived the dry season to breed. But on the other hand, we thought the dry season in these first 10 years was extremely severe, very few small soft seeds, the large hard tribular seeds and hard apuntia seeds. We watched the hybrids with their intermediate beaks try and crack them, and none of them could. So we wondered if it wasn't a genetic factor, but purely an e ecological factor. And this turned out to be so, because after the 1983 El Nino, um, when the island was converted from a large hard seed producer to a small soft seed producer, then the hybrids began to survive. And they survived and they back crossed. So at this point, which was 1986, we got this trickle of hybrids um, between Fortis and Scandens um, at this point, and genes from Scandens flowed into Fortis and contributed to the average bill size of Fortis becoming much more pointed. Another way of looking at this is that if we look at a plot of the beak sizes, beak depths of bet between beak length, um, in the first 10 years of the study, in examples 1975, Fortis and Scandens were clearly different, but then after 1986, because of this trickle of hybrids, they began to fuse, and this continued for the next 30 years. So we can ask at this point, were there specific alleles introduced from Scandens into Fortis that could have contributed to Fortis' more pointed beak? Now, Peter told you about this um, ALX1 gene that um, contributes to pointed beaks, and he told you it came in two forms, one that contributed pointed bills and another that um, caused blunt bills. So we were able to track the genes that were going from Scandens into Fortis because we still had the blood samples from these times. So we were able to send them over to um, Uppsala University. They were able to do genome analysis on them um, and send them back to us. And we did this blind, so we knew what the results were and who was the hybrids and who weren't, but they didn't. And we found that the ALX1 um, pointed allele was transferred from Scandens into Fortis and contributed to the Fortis more pointed beaks. Now, gene exchange goes both ways. It goes from um, Scandens into Fortis, but it also goes from Fortis into Scandens. And as we would expect, the average beak shape of Scandens from this point on was plummeted, and the average beak shape became um, blunter and much more Fortis-like to a noticeable stint. So the genetic and morphological variation increased both in Fortis and Scandens. These are photographs of Scandens, all taken in 2012. The Scandens at the top has a long pointed bill and um, is um, and it's homozygous for the pointed allele, and it's exactly like the Scandens before there was hybridization and introgression. These Scandens at the bottom have the Fortis blunt allele in them and have a much blunter, more Fortis like bill. So we had argued that um, introgression between Fortis and Scandens population, we had shown that it had increased the morphological and genetic variation, and we argued that in a new environment, this increased variation could fuel a rapid change along a different trajectory. And we never thought that we would see such a thing, but we did. And this, um, a bird arrived actually in 1981. It arrived on Daphne at a time when we had all the birds banded on the island. It looked like a fortis, but fortis was about 17 grams. This was 28.5 grams. It was like a gigantic fortis. Um, we took a blood sample of it, um, and as it it's arrived as a young bird, but when it started to sing as an adult, it had a completely unique song, a song that had never been heard on Daphne before. Now, at this time, we only had microsatellite loci, and we thought, examining the birds with the microsatellite loci, that the most parsimonious um, conclusion we could come to well, we first of all showed that it definitely had not been born on Daphne, but it seemed that it was 
of Portus scandens Portus hybrid back cross born on the nearest large island of Santa Cruz. And we went along with this idea and even published this idea until just um, a few, uh, a couple of years ago when we sent our blood samples over to um, uh, Uppsala and the surprising news came back that it wasn't a Portus scandens Portus hybrid back cross from Santa Cruz. We've been completely wrong. It was actually a Connie Rostrus from this island of Espanola, a hundred kilometers away or more from Daphne. But it came out as this perfect Connie Rostrus. And this was actually published by Science last week. So um, this is completely up to date. Now this bird took a long time to breed. Um, when it did breed, it first of all bred with a Portus scandens Portus um, back cross born on Daphne. It produced a few offspring, but none of them survived. Then it bred with a Portus, and then it started to produce offspring. We followed all these offspring. We took blood samples from them. We took measurements from them. And um, we were following this when along came the two and a half year drought between 2003 and 2005. And all these birds went out except for these two, uh, an inbred brother and sister. And I should say that all these offspring um, showed genetic transmission from 5110, the initial um, bird that came in, and all males sang the 5110 song. So we were left with a brother and a sister. Um, when the rains came back again, two and a half years later, the brothers and sister bred with each other. They produced 26 offspring. All but nine survived. Um, we had a daughter breeding with her father, a son breeding his with his mother, and the rest of the swibs breeding with each other that produced more offspring that bred with each other that produced more offspring that bred with each other. All birds showed gen genetic transmission from the original colonist, which we called 5110. All males sang this unique song, 5110's unique song, and all were large like 5110. And as you would expect, the inbreeding coefficient from whole genome analysis um, was shooting up with every generation. It started low because it was a hybrid after all. And then it got increasingly, um, in, in, increasingly more inbred. But even now, it is very inbred, but it's not exceptionally inbred for, um, for some other populations when we can compare it with other populations. But also what was extremely interesting was that this big bird, we call it the big bird population, was not actually directly intermediate between Portus and Conirostrus, but was displaced. So there had been an allometric shift, and it had a relatively large beak for its body size. It fed, it has a, a diet which covers all of the other finches. It eats a large variety of foods, but it's particularly um, efficient at dealing with tribulus seeds, this large, hard tribulus seeds that in the past has made the difference between survival and non-survival during the drought. It is as efficient as Magnorostris at cracking tribular seeds, far more efficient as Portus. But being um, with a large beak and a small body, it requires far fewer tribular seeds to survive a drought than Magnorostris does. So it's in a pretty good shape at the moment. Is this new lineage behaving like a separate species? It is large, much larger than its nearest relative, Portus. In morphological space, it lies between Magnorostrus and Portus, and this is the uh, space that was enlarged at the time when Magnorostrus outcompeted the largest Portus in the character displacement event Peter told you about. It sings, as I said, a very different song from Portus, Scandens, and Magnorostrus. It holds contiguous territories on the island, the blue dots, so the territories before the drought, the red dots after the drought. It defends its territory against each other. These territories overlap with Fortus, Scandens, and Magnarostris, 
um, who it completely ignores, and it is ignored by them. Thus, in all respects, this new lineage is functioning as a separate species. Now, do I have time to show a two-minute video of this? Yes? So this is um, a video which tells you a little bit about it, and so you can actually see it. Uh. Whoops. How does a new species form? The standard explanation is that the process begins with part of a population splitting off and entering a new environment. In a paper published in Science in November 2017, we show how hybridization can play a role. This bird is a member of a new lineage of finches on the Galapagos island of Daphne Major. The lineage originated by hybridization of an immigrant with a resident species. The immigrant was an exceptionally large male with an unusual song. To our surprise, DNA sequencing from a small drop of its blood revealed that it was a conirostris, like this one, from Española Island, a hundred kilometers away. The immigrant eventually bred with a resident fortis, like this one. Their offspring learnt their father's unique song and bred with each other, and so did their offspring. We followed this highly inbred lineage for six generations over more than 30 years. Interestingly, members of this lineage differ from both their conirostris and their fortis ancestors. They have large beaks relative to their body size, and they eat a wide variety of foods. The key to their ecological success and reproductive isolation is their unique morphology and distinctive song that differs from the other three finch species on the island. Three generations of big birds. Fortis. Standings. The lineage is flourishing, but how long it will survive, we do not know. Regardless of whether the new lineage succeeds or not, it provides an example of one way in which a new species can arise through hybridization. I should just say that um, we know that both HMGA2 and ALX1 are involved in these changes, but we also know that there are other genes involved. And at the moment, we're trying to work out the genetic underpinning of this difference, um, in, um, particularly in the difference where we have an unusually large beak on a small body. Uh, so in summary, we began... Um, in 1983 with only two species on the island. Then after the enormous El Nino event of 1983, the hybrids survived, Fortis and Scandens began to fuse with each other, Magna Rostris came onto the island, outcompeted the large Fortis, and the big bird lineage moved right in. So I think we all know this diagram of Darwin's, the only diagram that Darwin had, and this is from his notebook when he was trying to think about the relationship of the different species, and he drew this little diagram and wrote, I think, would he now join up some of these twigs and write, I now realize? We hope so. So we thank our many graduates, our postdoctoral fellows, our collaborators, and our daughters who helped with this. Without uh, these people, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this work. Um, but anybody who's worked on this island, I would think would like to leave you with two messages. The first is a conservation one. Environments and populations are dynamic and they are constantly changing. For a sustainable world, we must keep them both capable of further natural change. The other message is that we live in exciting times. The genomic data is rapidly accumulating, getting cheaper every year. 
This can enhance our field studies, but reciprocally, a reliable interpretation of genetic data requires an understanding of ecology, evolution, and behavior in the natural world. And I think this latter part is perhaps sometimes forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you. How long did I think? <laughs> You made this astronomer wish she was a biologist. This is really <laughs> fascinating. Um, we have time for a couple questions. We should have uh, Mike set up on either side of the room. Can we ask you to come out if possible? And then we'll take turns on either side. We have a, we'll start over here since we have a question. Yeah, hi. I'm curious what you think is the prospect for this inbred lineage. Um, we generally think of in inbreeding as a bad thing. Um, is this threatening to the survival? Sorry, where are you? <laughs> He's over here, oh, sorry, there. on the left. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, inbreeding is a bad thing. You notice that it hasn't become extremely inbred. Now, it could become very inbred. We know other populations on the Galapagos, um, the, the population of mockingbirds that has been on a small island of Champion for well over 100 years. The population is varies, but it can go as long as, uh, as low as 12 individuals up to maybe 20 individuals and back again like that. It's still flourishing. So, um, so there are some bird populations that can do very well on, um, even though they become very inbred. And I think there's a really intriguing question here. Birds have a large number of chromosomes. And so with every, um, so that there is um, naturally a terrific amount of recombination that goes on. Um, so that may keep the inbreeding level down. I think if it was a mammal, it would be in far greater trouble. But it's an, it's an, intriguing, an intriguing problem about how did, and our finches have um, about 68 chromosomes. And many of them are microchromosomes, but there's still recombination in those cr chromosomes. So it's a, a really intriguing question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question um, really deals with a reflection on the role of luck in uh, your, <laughs> your studies. So yes. I can only imagine that I know. if you had chosen a different island, uh, you might not have uh, had as much fortune. So maybe just uh, reflect on your many decades of work of yeah. the mixture of luck and persistence. And if I might add uh, another quick question after that. Okay, well, I, oh, sorry. Should Two I answers to that, and Rosemary can give the second one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your one? <laughs> I'll give you the first one. The, f <coughs> the first one is there's no luck involved. <laughs> <laughs> we ordered up a watering experiment <laughs> for 1983. We got that, and then we said, well, now the island is transformed. We need a drought. Two years later, we had the drought. <laughs> There's a serious answer, and Rosemary will give you that one. Okay. <laughs> the serious answer is that we had, a, uh, the first is we had an extraordinary amount of luck. I mean, to get, the, to get um, both an uh, absolute El Nino, that the last El Nino of that magnitude had been 400 years ago, according to coral core data. And then we had this two and a half year drought. And so we had drought, so that was really luck in, our, in the time that we had. Um, where the choice of Daphne, I think we can argue, was not so, um, this was a deliberate choice. And we chose Daphne because it was a low island. And we knew that the birds, um, we'd already looked at other islands, and the birds actually stayed on Daphne. And whereas on other islands um, that were much higher, the birds during a drought would move up the mountain and go up into the cloud forest. Whereas on Daphne, they couldn't move. They just stayed there. So th it, we chose that island deliberately because we knew that in droughts, um, 
a large number of birds would be able to, would die, and they did. I mean, it was 80% in one and 90% in the other birds died, and that would give us a chance to see and measure if there had been natural selection going on. So it was a combination of luck and a little bit of foresight, but the luck was certainly there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Just one other point. Um, yes. you, you reflect on, obviously, the interrelationship of, of species, whether animal and, and, and uh, flora. So yeah. what indeed has uh, changed in the flora uh, mm -hmm. that, in a sense, corresponds uh, to the changes in the finches, if, yes. if it exists at all? Do you want to answer that, or shall I? I can hear it. Now, what changed in the flora? Oh. Um, that, that affected yes. the finches. What changed in the flora? Yes. Um, the vines belonged to species that were rare at the beginning and were abundant afterwards. Uh, Trivulus, the plant that was so common in the very dry conditions in the first eight years, uh, became almost extinct. Um, but... Um, well, I should hesitate to say that. They certainly became rare. The re it's a perennial plant, and many of the pl uh, s plants uh, were smothered to death uh, by all of the growth in 1983. But several survived, not as seeds, but as plants, and then grew up again. But they did not resume a dominant role in the, spe in the seed um, species composition for about 25 years later. And we could give you other examples, smaller examples of plants winking in, Winking out, grasses came in in the 1983, persisted for a couple of years, disappeared because of the drought that followed the El Nino of 83, and so on. No substantial long-term uh, change in the species composition. There were still the same trees, still the same cactus bushes, uh, almost all of the herbs, but from year to year, changes in composition and proportions. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that um, the baby birds, the males, learn their song from their fathers during a very narrow window of time. Yes. What happens if the male bird dies, male parent dies, before he is able to teach the song to his male children? Yes. What song do they end up singing, and are they able to track mates since they don't know the song of their species? Yeah, well, this is actually how, um, uh, how we get a change in song. Because it, one of the things is if a male dies, then the young birds in the nest will learn the natal neighbor song. And if that natal neighbor is a num another species, then it will learn that species song. And this is how we actually started some of this hybridization. So, you know, a, f a fortress, let's say a father died, and the scandens was the natal neighbor, um, then the birds in the nest would learn the scandin song. And then when it grew up, it would mate with the scandens. So, the so, songs that's, so that's how the hybridization started. So the songs actually evolved too, not just the birds over time. Um, the songs do change over time, <laughs> but those are uh, well, the songs do. But once a bird sings a song, it keeps it for life. And you could, we have, um, we have long pedigrees of great uh, of sons, fathers, grandson, great-grandsons, great-great-great-grandsons, and great-great-great-grandsons. So long pedigrees which you can actually recognize. But having said this, and this is a whole other seminar, when a Magdorostis came into the island, we actually got a shift in the songs of Fortis and Scandins, and we were able to show that that shift occurred at the time the bird was learning the song. So it was almost as though there was interference from Magnarostris, which sang in the same frequency bandwidth. And the young birds were hearing a song that was uh, interrupted by Magnarostris, and it ended up that they actually were singing the same song, but faster and <laughs> compressed. And so the song differences r were, were very distinct after that. So that sort of thing is going on, yes. I find it fascinating that the founder of the big bird lineage um, was much more willing to hybridize with his neighbors than his offspring were. In fact, his offspring uh, stuck together um, yes. despite the fact that they didn't encounter any uh, challenges which their father 
did not, um, like the differences right. in song and differences in environments and so forth. Why do you think that the offspring decided to uh, stick together with each other uh, reproductively rather than branching outward to the other species on the island? Yes, I know. This is, um, well, it took a long time for this um, immigrant, 5110, to actually breed. And when, and when he did breed, he bred with this Fortis Scanlon's Fortis hybrid. And then he eventually bred with a Fortis. But that was towards the end of the breeding season. And it was almost as though, um, there were and it was at a time when um, actually there were fewer males than females. And so it was almost though as a last resort. You know, you either breed mm -hmm. with something or... <laughs> <laughs> Or you get nothing. Or you get nothing. <laughs> I mean, that, that <laughs> might have been that. But when the offspring came, they had birds that looked like themselves and they had birds that sang the song that their father had. So they didn't have this. So I think it was one of these quirky things and I think it was going back to luck and chance. I think it was like that. Yeah. We'll do one more question. Um, I'm very curious about if there are any values involved in this whole process. Is there good and bad, like hybrid yay, or like more offspring yay, or people like dying no? Is there a value or just pure observatory audit, like all the stuff? Like well, well, the ones that die um, in our in the um, uh, during these terrific droughts are very much with a beak shape that is very tied to the available food. So um, at that time, you know, if you were lucky enough to be born with a large beak that was able to crack these tribulus seeds, well, then you had a much higher probability of surviving than you would if you were unlucky enough to be born with a small beak. But then in times when there was a lot of small soft seeds, it's reversed. So I'm not sure quite what you mean by value, but I that's... <laughs> that's survival <laughs> value. Oh, survival value. Yeah, okay, so the survival value is, you know, it depends very much on um, what you are born with, and, and but what are the conditions? The environmental conditions are absolutely crucial. I would like to add, add one thing to that, yes. if I may, and yes, that is that yeah. the island is very small, and by knowing where birds roost, we're able to find dead specimens. Horrible as that may sound. For a scientist, <laughs> it's nice to know where the birds are dying and be able to find out who has died by identifying the bands on their legs. And then having got that, we can then ask, did they die because they had an accident or did they die of starvation? Well, starvation would be no fat and open up the dead carcass and find no food in the gut. And that's exactly what we found. There were uh, dozens of birds in these droughts lying on the ground, and our daughters and ourselves managed to find quite a number of the total amount that had disappeared. So we know that they hadn't flown off to another island. They died on that island, and their stomachs were empty. They died of starvation. It is very unusual. It's unusual for scientists to be able to say the cause of death for any organism they study because it's so difficult to find them. All righty, well, let's thank the grants again for a fascinating <laughs> Well, you're done, you're good. <laughs> <laughs>